Well, good morning and welcome to Lighthouse Church Online once again. We uh, are glad you have joined us, but we do truly look forward to the day that we can take this knowledge that we've learned about tech and apply it to streaming live as we get to meet together again. Uh, for now, we are here in the Word over distance. Today we're going to be beginning a new series, and we're going to start in the book of Daniel. I've entitled this, God's Kings and the Ruler of All, because the theme of the book of Daniel truly is, in a lot of ways, the sovereignty of God. And we start the book with a story. We start with the story of a young man. If you can put yourself in his place, the Israelites had been defeated. The people of God had been beaten. They had been beaten badly. As a matter of fact, they had not only lost their sovereignty, they had been defeated years before. And the king installed in charge of Israel owed homage to the king of Babylon. And then he decided to do the ultimate foolish thing and rebel. When he rebelled, the king of Babylon came. He came with armies. He laid siege to Jerusalem. He destroyed it. He took the, the um, furnishings of the temple of God and hauled it back to Babylon and placed it in the temple of one of his own gods. The people of Israel were defeated. The place was desolate. Jerusalem had been destroyed, burned, people deported, and another deportation had come. If you can imagine the long line of people winding through the, the, the rough roads, the city of Jerusalem in ruins behind them. As they were ordered along by Babylonian soldiers and authorities. One young man in particular, somewhere around age 16, a noble youth by birth, this young man should have been in the prime of life, becoming an adult, taking on roles of importance within the court. Instead, here he was. He was a prisoner. He was a prisoner of the Babylonian Empire, and he was leaving behind all that he knew. Much of what he had known was, had been destroyed. What he hadn't been destroyed, he was leaving behind him. His family, you can imagine the wailing as many of these people were deported and families split apart. Some were being deported as slaves. Some were being sent out as uh, settlers to certain areas. That was one of the techniques of the Babylonian Empire was to uh, spread people around so that they couldn't be concentrated in one place to rebel. And some of them were going to serve the king. Their own king having been taken here they were, under the authority of a pagan king. There he sat in the wagon, as it rocked on the hard road. Or he may have possibly walked in a long line of dejected prisoners. His group, specifically chosen to serve the king, was a group of young men. Men who were of sound mind, sound body, who looked the part. One of the things that you always notice when you go somewhere like Disneyland is oftentimes you are served by people who look the part. Their costume is perfect. Their, their uh, looks are that all American youth. Well, here was that all Israelite youth. The king's orders had gone out and here he went. No choice over what was happening. Uncertainty in his mind. But surely, as the wagon moved along the road or as he trudged between the columns of troops, this echoed in his mind. The words of the prophet not too many years before. 
Therefore, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You eat the meat with blood still in it, pray to your idols and shed blood. Do you really think you will possess the land? You rely on your swords and commit abominable deeds. Each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Will you possess the land? This is what you must say to them. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. As surely as I live, those living in the ruins will die by the sword. Those in the open field I will give to the wild beasts for food. Those who are in the strongholds and caves will die of disease. I will turn the land into a desolate ruin. Her confident pride will come to an end. The mountains of Israel will be so desolate no one will pass through them. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I turn the land into a desolate ruin. Because of all the abominable deeds they have committed. That echoes in the mind. Can you imagine a more dejected column of people? A group of people who had not only been defeated, but when their king had seen his opportunity and rebelled, had then been just plain destroyed. As they approached Babylon, he looked up. He saw a great city on the horizon coming towards him. Every step drew him closer to a lifetime of servitude in the king's court, a lifetime of uncertainty, uncertain, horrible times. They entered the city. Up above them were one of the wonders of the world. Near the palace where the hanging gardens of Babylon stood up against the sky. A city like he'd never seen before in his life. He was herded into an area where he and the other youths selected to serve the king would live. And this is where we find Daniel. The prophet Ezekiel had let the people of Israel know that what they were doing would lead to their own destruction. He had told them that when they continued to commit abominable acts, when they lived by the sword and trusted in it, when they were bloodthirsty and killing other people, when they were living against God's law, that this was going to come back on them. Matter of fact, there are several things in that passage that I read from Ezekiel 33 said you eat the meat with the blood still in it you disobey God's laws that are meant for your own safety you pray to your idols you worship other gods and you shed blood you mistreat other people you rely on your swords you trust in something other than your God in times like we live when diseases run rampant when economies suffer, what do we trust in? Where do we put our trust? The Israelites had put theirs in the wrong place, and thus we find Daniel. It says this in the beginning of Daniel 1, and we are going to be in chapter 1 today as we look at Daniel and his life. We're going to go through the entire book in a series here. But we want to start with that image of this flawless young man with the words of that prophet echoing in his ears as he takes up his place in Babylon. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon advanced against Jerusalem and laid it under siege. Now the Lord delivered King Jehoiakim of Judah into his power, along with some of the vessels of the temple of God. He brought them to the land of Babylonia, to the temple of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. The king commanded Ashpenaz, who was in charge of his court officials, to choose some of the Israelites who were of royal and noble descent. Young men in whom there was no physical defect and who were handsome, well-versed in all kinds of wisdom, well-educated and having keen insight, and who were capable of entering the king's royal service. 
and to teach them the literature and the language of the Babylonians. So the king assigned them a daily ration from his royal delicacies and from the wine he himself drank. They were to be trained for the next three years. At the end of that time, they were to enter the king's service. As it turned out, among these young men were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But the overseer of the court officials renamed them. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, Hananiah he named Shadrach, Mishael he named Meshach, and Azariah he named Abednego. You have the whole circle here in the Babylonian court. This is a whole new position. These boys were probably, like I said, around 16 years old. They would be trained for three years, and at 19 or 20, they would enter the king's service. They would become his servants. They did this in Babylon for a couple of reasons. They wanted to have control. They would use members of nobility from where they had conquered. They would gain insight into those people, and they would have control of those people. You think about it, if you're a Star Trek fan, this is the first instance of the Borg. You will be assimilated. They basically incorporated those peoples that they had conquered into their own empire, taught them their ways, and in some ways erased who they were from, that made them unique from the history books. And here we have these four guys. This is a key moment as they entered the court. Daniel, God is my judge, is what his name means. Hananiah, the Lord shows grace. Mishael, who is like God. Azariah, the Lord is my help. They were renamed Daniel was named Belteshazzar. Bel protect his life. In other words, may the pagan god of Bel protect this person. Hananiah, the Lord shows grace. Shadrach. In other words, command of Aku, another Babylonian god. Mishael, who is like God. <laughs> In the ultimate irony, Mishach, who is like Aku. Azariah, the Lord is my help, Abednego, servant of Nebo, the god for whom Nebuchadnezzar was named. When you see this position with the words of the prophet, as I said, ringing in their ears, these men are renamed. Renamed for pagan gods, their defeat seems complete. When you erase a people's God, you erase their identity. They are now Babylonian. But these young men have an outstanding quality, and I don't know if it was because the um, words of the prophet rang so strongly that they were convicted, or if they were simply righteous from a young age, having been trained well in a corrupt culture. But these guys, in verse 8, distinguish themselves. They distinguish themselves from the other Jews who tried to fit in. They distinguish themselves from the other wise men who are being trained and taught and led to become leaders in Babylon. They distinguish themselves in this way. As they sat down and they saw what they were being offered. They saw what the training would be. They had been through orientation, so to speak, and they saw the delicacies of the king. In other words, food from the king's own banquet chamber that basically they were being fed as he ate. They were being given a high honor in the time and place, but it was not an honor that an Israelite wanted. What had gotten them there in the first place? In the case of the Israelites, it was judgment on sin. In the case of where we are at in our current culture, 
We have any number of things that get us where we're at. Sometimes it's our own fault and consequences in our life. Sometimes it's the consequences of things going on around you. Maybe Daniel, maybe these righteous young men that were with him had not earned this punishment that Israel had earned as a nation. Maybe they were just swept along. But either way, here they are. And when they see the food offered to them, they have a problem. Number one, it doesn't match Jewish dietary law. Number two, think of those words of the prophet. You eat the meat with the blood still in it. You bow down to idols. You worship other gods. Let me tell you, we worship all sorts of things. It doesn't take an idol on a shelf to worship a false god. We worship all kinds of gods. Some of us worship our families. Some of us worship security. Some of us worship power, some money, some sports. It all depends. But here we are. In verse 8, it says this, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the royal delicacies or the royal wine. He therefore asked the overseer of the court officials for permission not to defile himself. And God made the overseer of the court officials sympathetic to Daniel. But he responded to Daniel, I fear my master, the king. He is the one who has decided your food and drink. What would happen if he saw that you looked malnourished in comparison to the other young men your age? If that happened, you would endanger my life with the king. Daniel then spoke to the warden appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days by providing us with some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who are eating the royal delicacies. Deal with us in light of what you see. So the warden agreed to their proposal and tested them for 10 days. Daniel proposes a test. He says this, can we please not eat what the king is providing. Might seem like a rude denial, but here is the, the key. Meat given to the king and served in the king's court was first offered to the king's gods. As far as the Israelites were concerned, not only did it not meet their dietary laws, but this meat was defiled. When the prophet was lambasting them for what they had done, he was talking about the fact that they were worshiping false gods. Daniel and his friends don't want to be associated with these false gods, even though their names have been changed to reflect these gods. It's ironic that his three friends, who later on stand with their lives for the Lord, are only remembered by names given to them by pagan kings that reflect pagan gods. These men may have been young, but they were quite something. Daniel was very careful, if you'll notice. He was very courteous. He and his friends buckled down to their studies. He, as a representative of the group, it would appear, came to the official in charge and said, may we please not. He didn't demand. They didn't start a picket line. That would have been a quick trip to the executioner's block, but instead they respectfully approached the world. May Christians learn to respectfully approach the world in which we live when we disagree with it. Daniel did not expect them to simply accommodate themselves to him. He approached and he found favor. He found favor through the Lord, because what was he doing? He was seeking to serve the Lord. The court official gave him a very kind no. And then we move on here. He goes on to the, the next guy in charge, the next guy down the ranks, the one who's just in charge of him and his friends and a few others, and says, you know what? I understand the other guy's afraid. I understand this might be an issue for you. Give us a quick test. One that won't endanger anybody, one in which we can just honor God, and if we honor our God and our God honors us in return, 
let us continue that way. So the man agrees. These guys are wise, despite their youth. They are strong, despite their youth. May we train youths who reflect what these guys have. That kind of guts, that kind of strength. In verse 15, it says this, At the end of ten days, their appearance was better, and their bodies were healthier than all the young men who had been eating the royal delicacies. So the warden removed the delicacies and the wine from their diet, and gave them a diet of vegetables instead. Now as for these four young men, God endowed them with knowledge and skill and all sorts of literature and wisdom. And Daniel had insight into all kinds of visions and dreams. When the time appointed by the king arrived, the overseer of the court officials brought them into Nebuchadnezzar's presence. When the king spoke with them, he did not find among the entire group anyone like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and insight the king asked them about, he found them to be ten times better than any of the magicians or astrologers that were in his entire empire. Now Daniel lived on until the first year of Cyrus the king. So they give you a little bit of further, this is what happened. A little postscript to a book that we believe was mostly written by Daniel himself. Here we are. They come before the king and God has honored them. Because they honored him, he honored them. And he allowed them to flourish. They flourished in such a way that, wow, these guys all ought to be on this diet. Think of it as the late, the earliest uh, <laughs> of the diet raves here. But this is no mere lose some weight or um, you know, live a healthier life. This is honor God first. And God honors them. When they appear before the king, they're able to answer his questions. They have studied well. They have worked hard. And Daniel is setting the stage for his interaction with these kings. Daniel is going to be a major figure with the greatest kings of the greatest empires in the world for years to come. And his friends as well will have a major effect on policy within the empire, on declarations of the king, and on the whole world around them. They will have a legacy that holds firm you will be introduced in this book, as we have already seen, to many gods, but only one who can accomplish his will. You're going to be introduced to multiple kings, but there is only one king of kings. In the end, there's only one ruler of all, and the book of Daniel is all about that ruler. And it begins with this idea that when you honor God, he will provide for you. Daniel honors the Lord first. He is subservient to the authorities God has put above him. He knows that judgment on Israel has come from God's hand. Not from some pagan god or pagan king, but because God used them. God raised them up. God will tear them down. God will use them in the meantime. Daniel and his friends, God is my judge. The Lord shows grace. Who is like God and the Lord is my help. They will lead a nation in exile and they will encourage the world in the name of God. This is an amazing book. As we get to the first story in which Daniel really begins to his meteoric ascent to the top. Understand it started with some 16 year old men who decided that they would honor God if possible before defiling themselves. That they would honor him 
at risk to themselves, that God was more important than simply pleasing people around them, than simply blending in and disappearing. At this point, many people would want to blend in and disappear. What happens when disaster comes? We want somebody to blame. We want to look for some reason. We want to blend in. We want to disappear. We want to be provided for. They were in the ideal position to blend in and be provided for, but instead they stood out. And God provided for them. They didn't trust in the earthly kings. They didn't trust in the false gods. And God honored them. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for Daniel and for his friends. We pray, Lord, that you would be honored through us as you were honored through these young men. We pray that in our day and time, with the issues that we face, that we would be as focused on you as these guys were. And Lord, we thank you for your provision and your love, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a blessed day.